Okay, so welcome everyone um, to some of our student oriented sessions and sessions that are designed to help you either prepare for graduate school or help you um, get into the job market. So first up, we have Dr. Brunson from Vanderbilt University. He is currently the Assistant Dean of the Vanderbilt, Gradu Vanderbilt University Graduate School um, and the Director of the Graduate Schools Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education Program. He is responsible for leading the recruitment and the retention efforts for any underrepresented minority PhD students in all fields and women PhD students majoring in STEM fields. Um, he's also Vanderbilt's institutional coordinator and a summer program coordinator for the Leadership Alliance. Um, he's also the uh, advisor for the Organization of Black Graduate and Professional Students and has represented Vanderbilt at the Leadership Alliance, the National Name Exchange, the National GEM Consortium, and the Institute for the Recruitment of Teachers. So prior to Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Brunson received his bachelor's in chemistry from Morgan State University and a PhD in toxicology from MIT. He then went on to do a postdoc at Johns Hopkins and then later changed his career path from research to university administration, first at MIT and Morgan State before moving to Vanderbilt in 2009 where he's been since. Um, so just on a personal note, Dr. Brunson has played really a pivotal role in my academic and career journey. We met when I had just begun research as an undergraduate in the McNair Scholars Program at Ryder University. And he was there through the time I walked the stage at, um, when I was receiving my PhD. So he was really key in making sure that I not only made it to graduate school, but that I made it through my PhD at Vanderbilt. Um, so he's definitely a great resource as he has on the slide here, let's keep in touch. Uh, he's a great person to keep in touch with. Um, so without further ado, here is Dr. Don Brunson, who will be sharing some insight on the graduate school admissions process. Take it uh, away, Dr. B. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so I put a link in the chat box uh, and it's that that you see on the slide. So you can complete that. It should take you a whopping two to three minutes to do it. Uh, if you complete that link before uh, 6 p.m. Central Time today, uh, we will give you a graduate school fee waiver uh, for your application if you apply to our PhD program. And uh, this fee waiver will be good for up to three years. So if you're a sophomore or a junior, or if you decide to do a master's degree and then apply to PhD, you will have this fee waiver and you will not have to pay our $95 application fee. And it's not one of those things that could be one-time use. So say, for example, you were in a master's program and you decided to apply and then you changed your mind and it's because something, you know, life happens and you want to do it a year later, it's still valid for three years, okay? So if you click the link in that chat box, you will do that. So let us begin. So today I want to talk about the nuts and bolts of the graduate school application because this thing is not necessarily implicit and there are a lot of things that students do that might necessarily uh, might not necessarily be helpful to them. Uh, I say that because this application is very different from the application that you completed for your undergraduate education. So um, I'm going to start by um, asking the question, who reads your graduate school application? So it will be an admissions committee, and that committee will be made up mostly of faculty members, if not all faculty members. There could be some person on there who could be part of a recruiting team, but you can believe and you can make your bet that it's gonna be mostly faculty members. So with that in mind, uh, what does this admissions committee expect to learn from reading your application? Um, if you think about what graduate school is and this whole, experience um, in the graduate education enterprise, there are some things that are really important. Um, they are interested in your academic ability, your analytical ability, that is your ability to form and answer questions, uh, your persistence and motivation. You're doing research. We have a joke that says it's called research because you, you start searching for an answer and you don't find it. So you research and you research and you research and you keep doing that until you find the answer. Uh, they're interested in your creativity and vision. Uh, your ability to multitask, you're going to be doing more than one thing at a time. Uh, your ability to write clearly and concisely, that is what we do as scientists. We do research and then we write about it regardless of whether that's in your notebook or whether that's in a journal uh, publication. Uh, your ability to collaborate productively. Uh, you rarely, unless it's some kind of review article, uh, you rarely see any, uh, um, any research done that has a single name on it. 
So there will be multiple names. So your ability to collaborate um, productively is important. Um, on this application, they want to make sure that your research interests match uh, those of a faculty member uh, in the program or the department. Um, and to think about it holistically, it's basically about your, product, your productivity. How productive can you be as a, as a uh, graduate student in a research lab? Well, with this application, there are basically three different parts. There's the biographical information, objective information, and uh, subjective criteria. So uh, regarding the biographical information, that's pretty straightforward. Who you are, where you attend school, where you live, your email address and phone number, that's the biographical. You know, they might ask some demographic information. That's the kind of biographical information. Then we get to the objective criteria. The major objective criteria on a, on a graduate school application is going to be about your grade point average, your curriculum, and in some cases, standardized test scores. Um, with respect to your grade point average, they're interested in both your cumulative and your major grade point average, and this should be reasonable. Uh, students said, oh, I don't have a 3.9 or a 3. .9. You don't have to have a 3.9 or 3.8. Listen, uh, some of the most prolific and productive researchers uh, you know, didn't have a 3.5 or something. Many of them do, but many of them don't. Um, remember that your grade point average is important, but it's not the end all and the be all. It is important, but it's not everything. They're interested in your curriculum. What courses did you take? If you are a chemistry major, there's only so, you know, outside of your required, you know, many schools have a, a liberal arts or, or, or some other kind of, of core requirements that are outside of your basic science curriculum, but um, they want to make sure that your coursework is appropriate and relevant for the field that you're trying to study. Uh, and it should be rigorous and comprehensive. If you know that you have options of who to take for organic chemistry, uh, you can take uh, the easy professor, you can take the tougher professor. If you take the tougher, tougher professor, then you'll probably be a little bit more prepared for a graduate curriculum, at least the coursework part of it. Um, keeping in mind that the courses that you take are representation of your scholarly preparation. Um, finally, standardized test scores. Now this is changing a lot. Um, there are still some programs that require GREs, both uh, general and subject, and some that are getting rid of. So you need to check uh, the, uh, the departmental um, the departmental requirements, but standardized test scores are a part of it. So together, they make up the objective criteria. They just are what they are. Then there are subjective criteria, particularly your statement of purpose, your letters of recommendation, and your academic and professional activities. Uh, that's going to be really, really important because it gives them great insight into who you are. So let's begin by talking about this statement of purpose. This statement of purpose is an essay that you write. And in this essay, basically you wanna come off as the best thing since the air conditioner in New Orleans in July. Something that everybody wants and needs. Now with this statement of purpose, there are two kinds of, there are basically two elements. So think about it simplistically. There are substance elements and style elements. Substance what you say, style, how you say it. So for example, if I just on the spot think about this, substance, what do you say? Hello, how you say it? You can say, what's up? But you can say, hi, how are you? So it's the same thing, substance, hello, style, something informal, what's up? Something more formal, hi, how are you? So think about these two things that will make up your statement of purpose. Now. With respect to substance, let's talk about that first. So there are required things that you have to say. There are some optional things that you can say. And we'll then talk about some required style elements, okay? So on your substance, the things that you want to convey in this statement of purpose are, what do you want to do? That is, what are your research interests and do they match those of faculty research interests? Um, second is, well, that's important because if a program does or the program or department doesn't know what you want to do, they can't determine whether you're going to be a good match. Second is, 
Why is this your interest? Why is this your interest? That is, what has led you to pursue graduate study, including your research experiences, your courses, your internships, your jobs, and even uh, experiences like this where you're attending a conference to learn more about it? And finally, what is your career goal or what are your career goals? These are the major substantive um, elements for uh, your state statement of purpose. Let's dig a, a little bit more into that. So specifically in your substance, um, not only are you gonna tell what you wanna do, you also wanna let folks know what faculty members you wanna work with and why you're applying to that specific program. Why are you applying to the chemistry program at, at IUPUI? Why are you, why are you applying to the why are you applying to the chemistry program at Emory? Why are you applying to the chemistry program at Rice? There are some optional things. Um, for example, uh, has your how has your diversity status shaped your interests, your academic journey, or what you want to do with your graduate? Um, some students have imperfect records. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Depending on the situation, explain, but don't make excuses uh, for any problems that you have on your academic record. Please understand when this faculty admissions committee is looking through your application, they're going to look at every single course that you took every single semester. So if there's a grade on there that you don't think properly defines uh, your knowledge or the work that you've done and it's on your transcript, don't pre pretend that not gonna see it, they're not gonna see it. They are going to see it and you should explain it. So now that we've talked about substance, now let's get into style. The style. Think about this. When the reader reads or anyone who reads your application should have the impression that you would be a productive graduate student. Keep that in mind. Stylistically, anyone reading this should think, oh my gosh, we cannot live without having her in our PhD program. So let's talk a little bit more about style with respect to how you should write this statement of purpose. It should be short and specific. It should be a page and a half to two pages long. No more, no more. Oh, and by the way, uh, folks my age, you know, sometimes your vision is not what it used to be. So my glasses. Um, do not choose to think that you're being clever by doing something in an eight or nine point font so that we'll have to go click, 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 magnify, magnify, magnify. This uh, statement of purpose should never be smaller than 10 points. Uh, and it's gonna be single space. So it's gonna be short specific, one to two page, one and a half to two pages, no smaller than 10 uh, point, And it's gonna be single space, single space. The other thing is when you are talking about the qualities that will, in, you know, in addition to the, in addition to the things that you're gonna, the, the other elements you're gonna talk about, like your research, et cetera, when you're talking about the qualities that will make you a good fit and a good match for that program, you're going to use uh, stories to highlight your strengths rather than assertions. You're not going to say, oh, I'm intelligent, I'm motivated, blah, blah, blah. You're going to tell some, give some little brief anecdote to demonstrate that. Also, very important with respect to style, it should convey to the reader why you should select me not why you want to be selected. Let me elaborate on that a little. So if your home institution says, we have a $5,000 scholarship that we want to give to a student sometime in the month of November, even if that student's bill is paid, that $5,000 can go directly to that student. How many of you are gonna say, oh no, beloved alma mater, please, I love you, but I don't need to take your money. Just your having me here is gonna be enough. No. No, you're going to want the $5,000. But the question is not, why should you be selected? It should be, why should you select me? Why should that $5,000 come to me? You don't want to tell them why you want to be in the program. They already know. We have a wonderful program, and we have given you the opportunity to apply to it. You should instead tell, this is why you should choose me for this opportunity. When you write it, it should be customized to the program that you're applying to. If that program has a certain specialty, uh, you want to make sure that you cite that and let them know that 
I, one of the reasons that I'm applying to this program is because of this expertise that you all have in this area. And you can even go on to talk about uh, specific faculty members. Actually, we really should talk about specific faculty members as we talked about earlier. And it should be conversational in tone as if you are addressing colleagues um, and not like your lecturing. Uh, my favorite one is having read some statements of purpose over the past years and uh, you know, some of my favorite one students in psychology. Psychology is the study of the human mind. Do you think that an admissions committee made up of faculty in psychology know what psychology is? Probably so. So don't lecture them about, you know, organic chemistry is how we, no, no, no. Trust me, the organic chemists are going to know what they say. Okay, other style elements. Uh, here's something, do not use humor. You don't know who's on that committee and you don't know the, you know, their age difference, background, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll give an example. Many years ago, I think I was probably in my first or second year here at Vanderbilt and I was on a, a summer research uh, program, an RU uh, admissions committee, and a student wrote on the application, if I am admitted to this program, I'm going to bring a New York swagger now. At that time, I was the youngest person on that admissions committee. I was the only person of color and everyone else was in their late 50s, early 60s, et cetera. And so they looked to me, oh, what is this New York swagger that the student wants to bring? And I was, uh, maybe it's some kind of scented oil, like, you know, but we can get past that. So yeah, don't use humor. You don't know who's reading and you don't know what they think is funny. Skip the flashy opening and closing. Since I've been five years old, I knew that I wanted to do something that had to do with analytical chemistry. No, uh, just skip the flashy opening. Just launch right into it. And to prevent you from having any kind of plagiarism, I've got a, an example of it from a different discipline that I want to share with you. Remember, what do you want to do? Why, you know, what, you know, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do this? Uh, why this specific program? Blah, blah, blah. Here's an example from a student in philosophy. This student says, I intend to earn a PhD in philosophy to begin my career as a faculty member studying political philosophy at a research one level institution. My career interest, uh, my research interests are in the areas of you know, contemporary continent, uh, continental philosophy, particularly for Kant. Uh, Africana philosophy, post-colonial theory, political philosophy, feminism, and media studies. In addition, as an African-American faculty member, I would like my research, teaching, and academic service, uh, service to serve as catalysts that inspire future students of color to pursue a career of academia. What do you want to do? Earn a PhD in philosophy. What are you interested? My research interests are these. What are your, you know, what are your, uh, what are your uh, career aspirations? Faculty member research and teaching that inspired future students of color. They now know what is this going to be about? It's like a movie. Um, and I'm sure you've all gone to movies or watching, you know, that opening scene where they set the stage and you know from that opening scene, this is really gonna be a good movie. You're like, oh my God, I cannot believe that I paid to see this. You want that first reaction. Nothing fancy, just launch right into it. You don't need to tell them, from the time I entered high school and I met my teacher, Professor Quasi Blank, and Professor Quasi Blank introduced me to like, no, you have a page and a half to two pages, valuable real estate. Do not go into all of that. Why would you be productive? I'm productive this opening paragraph because I know what I wanna do, the PhD. I know what I wanna study what debate the general field. I know specifically what topics. I know what I want to do afterwards. And I know the kind of institution that I want to be a part of. So you've set the stage without any cutesiness or anything like that. Okay. Remember I talked about uh, earlier about sometimes bad things happen to good people. Uh, um, you know, again, sometimes these things happen. Let me give you an example of a student who had something bad happen. This student says, also, from my research experience, I am well aware of the failures and setbacks that are associated with research. I have the resilience to learn from and use that knowledge as a catalyst to create project, pro, project, ugh, progress. 
For example, during the spring 2013, I suffered an illness which caused me to fall behind in my classes and miss a significant amount of work. Instead of getting discouraged and falling further behind, I developed a plan of action and implemented it. This plan included increasing my meeting time with my professors and adjusting my schedule to maximize the time needed to study and get back on track. I am prepared to apply these skills and this drive to succeed in my graduate work at the The point is, this student said, I had a problem and it occurred this time. So now they, you know, they, the faculty admissions committee would have seen this on the transcript. Instead of making the, uh, instead of the student uh, blaming someone else, like taking into account, oh my gosh, I would have the course of C minus Bing. That's not any Bing we know. That's just a fictitious name that I just thought of the top of my head. C minus Bing, who never gives a grade of higher than C. The student said, I had a problem. I met with my professor. I created a plan, gave a little bit of details about that plan and implemented it. Boom. Didn't go into too much detail, but again, remember we talked about uh, 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 if you have a if you have a, a quality to give a short narrative about it. This again shows resilient. The student didn't say I was resilient. Blah blah blah. Gave a narrative that demonstrated that quality. Now let's move on to letters of recommendations. So. When you're talking about your letters of recommendations, you want them to be mostly from folks who hold the minimum degree equivalent to your aspiration. Meaning, if you're applying to a PhD program and you have to do three letters of recommendation, I would say all three of those should be from PhD holders. Now, you could possibly do a fourth or fifth. They don't necessarily have to, but don't submit those fourth or fifth ones if they're not saying something that's not present in the other three letters. So if the fourth and fifth are adding some new information about you that's not present in the first three, then you shouldn't have them. But you definitely want to have them from folks who hold the degree that you're seeking, uh, and they should talk about specific comments that are justifying your, your, your evaluation. Don't just say, she's smart, she's, she's, uh, she's, she's, uh, she's dedicated. Give an examples, detailed examples of why you think this student or detailed comments that justify your, your, your description of this student. These comments from the folks that you ask should talk about your critical thinking, your analytical reasoning, your writing skills, your character, and your ability to work collaboratively, your ability to collaboratively work productively. These are critical skills for success in graduate school in your STEM disciplines. And they can be supportive of your academic uh, blemishes or offsets. So for example, this person knows that you had that rough time. This person can say, well, even though in the first semester of his sophomore year, he didn't do well in his courses, I can tell you as someone who has worked with him for multiple semesters that that time was not indicative of who he is, that this student is the real deal. If I had a chance to have this student, I definitely have him in my research group. So let me give you an example of some of the kinds of uh, two comments of uh, that uh, faculty members have given. And of course, uh, they've been uh, <coughs> they've been strongly appreciated. Here's one. This professor says, Gene is one of the most uh, the brightest and most motivated students I've had a chance to work with in my 30 year career as a researcher. I would not hesitate to sign her immediately in my group. This professor says, Mr. Stevens has great talent, potential, and qualities to be successful. He is bright, focused, very tenacious, competitive, and honest. He is able to work independently or in a group, and his collegiality and leadership skills are remarkable. I urge you to accept Mr. Stevens into your program and that you offer him a full tuition waiver and assistantship or fellowship if there is such available, uh, if there is such availability. So those are the kinds of comments that you want. And when you ask a faculty member to write a letter of recommendation for you, among the things you should do is to give them a copy of your resume or CV if you have that available, as well as a fairly late copy of your statement of purpose. Do not give them your still in progress, uh, I won't call it trash, your still in progress document. They need to understand what it is you're talking about because it's going to align. Think about, about it like, you know, your favorite 
pop or whatever kind of singer that your letter is going to be, you're going to be the lead singer. And what they're going to do is they're going to be backup singers. Um, while, you know, and, and while, you know, sometimes you can have, a, you know, a wonderful acapella performance, when you have this group performance, regardless of whether it's acapella or with instruments, your statements about who you are, what you want to do, combined with their substantiation and support of any and everything you say makes for a wonderful story. So your letters of recommendation, your statement of purpose combined um, to give you the, the, the support and the, and the credibility that you need to be a viable candidate for admissions to that program. The final thing you're gonna be talking about in your statement of purpose, uh, which is all part of this application is your academic and professional activity. So you're gonna talk about, um, these are the four characteristics, whether you're talking about your past um, research experience or professional activities, your current ones or future ones. Number one, the relevance of the activity. When you're talking, let's say it's a research project. Why did you do this? Many times students will just launch into the, you know, the, you know, the, this lab studies, blah, 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 blah. So why does anybody care about this? What is the story behind this? Why did somebody fund this research? So for example, uh, I was talking to one of the other uh, panelists about this. I, you know, in my research in, in graduate school, I studied uh, the relationship between consumption of salted fish and nasopharyngeal cancer. Well, why does anybody care? Well, it turns out that in Southeast China, there's a very high incidence of nasopharyngeal cancer. And it's so prevalent that many of these kids have a, a fatal case uh, of the or terminal case of disease while they're age 10. And if you find out what is in this food that's linking to this disease, you can reduce the incidence of this curve. Why is this research being done? What is your role in the activity? What did you do? Uh, did you wash glassware? Uh, did you, you know, did you, uh, were you part of the uh, major idea bank? What exactly did you do? You don't need to get into weeds, but you need to form a big picture of what you do. Um, give a concise description highlighting the results. What did you learn? So this, this is why this research is being done. This is what you do. What did you find? What does it mean? And finally, how did that activity help, pre uh, um, help prepare you for graduate study? So what did you do? Why did you do it? What did you learn? What does it mean? That is how you talk about your academic and professional activity. Finally, for those who, uh, I'm gonna give a plug, those who are not graduating in 2022 or do not plan to uh, be in a graduate program before uh, fall 2022, there are opportunities for summer research at Vanderbilt. And we are having in-person research experiences again this summer, uh, as we did last summer. So if you are interested in this, you can visit this website, gradschool.vanderbilt.edu forward slash research forward slash summer research and learn more about this. So your takeaways. The statement of purpose is your opportunity to tell your story in one and a half to two pages, single space and a 10 point, no smaller font of why you are a strong viable candidate for that opportunity, which is typically graduate education uh, as a PhD candidate in that program. Your letters of recommendation will allow um, a credible peer of the admissions committee to advocate on your behalf for the program that you're applying to. And finally, your tasks. If you haven't started your graduate school application for those who it, who it applies to, start it immediately. Use these tips and the presentations to get your personal statement. I should have write, written a statement of purpose, you know that, get it right and select the correct recommenders and give them the materials they need to write a strong recommendation and give them time to write their letters. Um, and at this point, I will finally once more come back here uh, so that you can, um, so that you can uh, get a chance to get your application fee waiver. I'll put that link in the box once more, I just did. And so at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take any questions that you all have about anything. I see Miss Emily looks like she's writing vigorously. And what I'm going to do is, I'm not calling you out, I'm just making everybody pay attention. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this, a copy of this presentation, which I already have prepared, um, for you so that you can use any of those tips. Um, and I also really put my email address in there so that uh, we can talk more and 
uh, maybe at some point, uh, 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 Dr. Jade and the good folks who organize this conference will have me do the other part. I have a very detailed presentation. It's almost an hour long, uh, more detailed on how to write this statement of purpose. Um, so that's, it's a big, big deal. So um, at this point, I'm opening the floor for your question. Uh, and I'll ask our good moderator to, if he can share any questions that you all have. Um, and thank you for allowing me to share with you what I know about graduate admissions. After all. That was great, Don. Yeah, you know, there, there was a question that came over from the WOVA platform and uh, yes. it is uh, how much time in a lab is sufficient for an undergrad to be considered uh, a little ready for grad school? Uh, and it says, I know this might be subjective, but I want to know the speaker's thoughts. So I would suggest, so if this, so under the assumption that you are a full-time student taking somewhere between 15 and 18 credits, and you know, again, having been a chemistry major undergraduate, bless my heart, that's a lot of time, you know, you've got a lot of credits. So you, you know, you've got your coursework, you've got lab work, you've got the homework that's associated with the courses, you've got to write the lab report with your lab members, because, you know, sometimes they're individuals, and you've got to get everybody together, so how much time is good for research? I would say um, if you are unable to devote at least 10 hours, it gets tricky. Let me tell you why, because when you're talking about that lab experience to make you a little ready for graduate school, you're talking about, number one, you've got to think out your experiment, uh, experiments. Because you remember, you're doing research, not like in your lab where, you know, you've got these things that, you know, it's almost like recipes, you know, do these things and yes. And you, you know, and you know whether, you know, oh my gosh, uh, my product turned out yellow. It's supposed to be blue, it probably didn't work. So you're gonna have to set up your, you're gonna have to think out your exper experiment. And uh, I, yeah, you know, I want to write it out before you do it, just like you do in that laboratory. You're going to have to actually execute the experiment. So you're going to write it out. You've got to set it up. You've got to actually do the experiment. You're going to have to look at the results and analyze them. Then you're going to have to write about it in your lab report. That is not a small activity. And you're going to have to do this repeatedly. So, you know, if, you know, it, it takes a lot of time. So if you are spending less than 10 hours a week, I'm not sure how valuable it's going to be. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not going to be valuable. And that also is for folks who are doing wet math. If you are computational, that is a completely different world. Your lab is your laptop. Um, and so, yeah, you can just go along with it. You can decide, you know, and, you know, and it's also a different kind of thinking where uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised that if many of the folks in computational are visual learners, where they can actually think about these things and then boom, 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 let go to the screen. Well, as a wet lab, you can visualize anything you want. You'll just be staring at some glassware and flasks and yeah, and instruments. You can stare all day uh, and nothing's gonna get done. So I would say 10-ish hours. That's great, that, th thanks a lot. But another question came in, in your opinion, how much is too much detail when explaining past hiccups in a statement of purpose? Too much detail. Remember, you you are you you have this hiccup. You know what it is. Uh, again, let's pick on uh, C minus B. Nobody we know. So uh, you got a C minus in in Professor Bing's class, and uh, you know the reason. Now sometimes the reason is you just underestimated him. See, it's not you. You just underestimated him. And so you didn't study as hard. Uh, you didn't put as much effort into it. And by the time exam time came, you dug a hole for yourself. So the level of detail was during the spring 2019 semester, uh, I took Professor Bing's analytical chemistry class. And uh, I was, I was, I was, I inappropriate, or I did not prepare the way I, I thought I should have. I believe from past experiences in, uh, in uh, general chemistry course that this would just be a cakewalk. My underestimation caused me to, to perform poorly in this course. However, um, I learned, I, I, I took uh, having 
you know, having gotten a, a, a marginal grade of C in, in Professor Bing's class, I then learned my lesson, took Professor Bing's advanced class, which was much more rigorous and required much more. And I earned an A in that course uh, and also was recognized as, as the most outstanding student in the course. So too much detail. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to say, yeah, I was like Professor Bing. Oh, he's cool. He even makes jokes in class. Well, it turns out the joke was on you because you got to see. But you don't want to say that. Um, you definitely want to make sure that um, you tell, this is what happened. You got to see in the course. This is why I got to see in the class. Um, I, you know, I went to remedy it, but it was too late. However, when I took Professor Bing uh, again, I earned an A in the course and was recognized as the most outstanding student. Don't make excuses. Don't talk about that you're probably going to get a C minus because Bing is just such a horrible, nasty chemistry person. But yeah, yeah, he's he can be like that. Unlike our beloved Jade Bing, you know, listen, if you look under, if you go to Google and look under Angel, you'll probably see the picture of Jade there. At least that's what it looked like in my in my dictionary. Any other questions? You've got me right here. No I, um, I, oh, sorry. I Hello. do have a question and it's kind of, oh, my name is Emily. Um, it's also funny that I'm also applying for a PhD in chemistry. So everything you said about chemistry is just so relevant. <laughs> <laughs> what field of yes. chemistry? Uh, inorganic. Oh, inorganic. In? inorganic. Oh, bless your heart. That's oh. in heaven for you. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess that you know, on the topic of diversity, I do come from a bit of a diverse background myself, but I'm not sure if I should really include my experiences in my statement of purpose, because while they have shaped my motivations, I don't know how an admissions committee would feel reading about some of the things I've gone through. So I was just wondering in how much detail should we explain, you know, maybe our family situation or socioeconomic status, if that has indeed shaped our motivation. Absolutely. You absolutely should. The reason is because it shows a part of your resilience. And listen, as experimentalists, uh, you know, there's going to be a part as everybody here who has a PhD in, in a science discipline, uh, an experiment will tell you, there will come this point where you just plateau and almost 90% of the stuff that you do will fail and it will just wear you down. That's just the nature of experimental research science. And what happens, you, you and your experience will show that you've had, you've overcome this, you've overcome that, you overcome this, and you have continued to succeed. These are characteristics of, these are, are part of, it builds character, resilience, but it also shows persistence that you didn't just walk away and say, I'm just not gonna do this. So not only, where you persistent, you are resilient, and it builds character. And these are qualities that are extremely important. Heck, anybody can stay in a PhD program when everything you do turns to gold. What happens when it turns to crap? And you're, you know, you're using up a lot of reagents, and some of these reagents can be really expensive. Or, you know, uh, you know, you're doing something, you know, with, with, you know, you're doing some kind of reaction that can be really, really, uh, that can damage pieces of equipment, uh, everything from glasswork to an instrument. And your and your your advisor like listen you know I need you to know these columns are not inexpensive okay or you're spending a lot of time in the NMR lab <laughs> um, you know and your and your products look like what nothing like you you know tried to do so yeah these are all things you absolutely positively should you know there was another couple of questions here too uh, what if our and I'll answer them as quickly as possible okay. What if our previous research projects are of a slightly different subject than the one for, uh, in which we want to pursue our PhD in? How do we connect it to the research interests of the potential university slash research group? Oh, this is pretty simple. That is called breadth. That is, so there's depth doing one thing over time and breadth doing many things. What you want to do is you want to tell from each experience what, remember we talked about that? What you learned and how those skills or that or, or what you learn from each research project that will be applicable to your being a successful student in that PhD program. Okay. 
And there's one more in regards to applications. Do you have any specific tips on ways to highlight work in industry if you didn't go straight from undergrad slash masters to a PhD program? Oh yeah, that's we talked about that. These are part of the things that make you, when you were in industry, what did you do? Um, so for example, did you have any kind of leadership experiences? What you know that might you know sometimes you might be asked to take be the lead graduate student on a project. Um, what kind of organizational skills? If you're doing research, you got to be organized. What kind of writings did you do? What kind of, you know the reports that you had to do in the work? So yeah, so you can highlight the the uh, leadership that you had, the kinds of, ex the, the different kinds of experiments that you had to do, the reports that you had to write, write, the kinds of collaborations you do, all critical elements for success in graduate school. All right, I think we're at time. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm sure that Don would be really happy for you to just shoot him a message uh, through the Wuhuva app. So uh, I guess we can all virtually you know, thank our speaker today. Thank you so much. Uh, it looks like this was, very educational and we had a lot of great questions. Thank you. And uh, just one quick question before I go, I should upload my presentation where? Uh, you can send that to me if you'd like and I can go ahead and upload it for you. Fantastic, I will do that in the next couple of minutes. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you and for inviting me to participate. Uh, you all have a great rest of your conference for some of you around this evening. I'll be talking to you again. Take care. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you.